All right. 10 o'clock. Everybody ready? We're good. Everybody here? 4, 6, 10, almost. All right. Today we're going to talk about Ajax. Hi, thank you. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about, is this big enough for everybody? Can everybody see from where they are? One size bigger. OK, I'll close the side panel. We'll see how that works. How's that? Does that work? Perfect. OK, today we're going to talk about Ajax. Um, let's take a look at our to do's before we start talking about what Ajax is. So um, we are going to use Ajax to retrieve data from a, a remote server. We're going to use then use jQuery, which you learned about yesterday, to update the DOM with that retrieved data. Then we're going to use Ajax again to submit data to a server. And we're going to do all of that without ever refreshing the browser. That, that is insane. So let's talk about Ajax. Does anyone know what Ajax stands for? It's an acronym. Asynchronous JavaScript. And they kind of cheated with the ant. And XML. Does anyone know what XML stands for? For bonus points, you don't. Nobody uses it. Well, it's rarely used anymore. That's right. It is a markup language. It's extensible. And once again, they cheated with the X there. Markup language. And when Ajax, the, uh, the technology, was coming together, XML was the way that we transmitted uh, encoded data. Uh, we use JSON nowadays, but XML was simply, it looked an awful lot like uh, HTML, but instead of being limited to uh, body, uh, head, P tags, div tags, stuff like that, it's extensible. So you could make up your own tags. So you might have something like name. Let me. Uh, Scroll down a bit. There we go. You might have something like that. And then you'd have a parser, the same way we parse JSON. And it would just parse it back again and say, OK, you meant the name was whatever was inside of the element. Uh, so we've since moved on to JSON. So that was just a, a little aside. But what is AJAX? So AJAX was actually invented by Microsoft. Uh, another thing that we can thank Microsoft for, as well as VS Code. Um, you, you probably notice that when you use uh, native applications, applications that were built for, to run directly on the operating system, as in not in a browser, there is no refresh that happens. There's no, you don't have to navigate between URLs. You don't see a full page refresh. If you're on Steam or something like that, you click on the store, and the store shows up. You click on your library, and your library of games shows up. And there isn't really any kind of delay. You're not sending an HTTP request to getting something back. Um, so Microsoft wanted to mimic this native application for their Outlook users in the browser. Um, so what they wanted was you'd be staring at your inbox. And instead of having to hit refresh to check and see if you have new emails, it would, behind the scenes, pull the server and say, did any new emails come in? Oh, they did. Update your inbox. And then you see, and you've got a whole new, you've got emails coming in, and you didn't have to do anything. The user didn't have to do, really interact with it in any way. And so that was why Ajax came about. And it's actually the thing that spurred Web 2.0, because we went from mostly static websites where you're having to make get and post requests to do anything, to now we could have dynamic websites that are refreshing parts of the page, and elements of it with or without user interaction. And this actually led to the web that we use today. Uh, the vast majority of websites that you come across will be using Ajax in some way, shape, or form. So the way that it was implemented is with something called the XML HTTP request 
object, which you'll see in your dev tools is shortened to XHR. Uh, now, this is a much more verbose way of doing things, just like um, how in Node we can run an HTTP server without bringing in Express. We bring in Express because it makes it really easy for us. We can just define our routes and our methods and our callback functions when those happen. So we're not actually going to interact with this XHR object. We're going to use jQuery, which has wrapped this, because jQuery gives us a lot of helper methods so that we don't have to do this long, verbose syntax. But you absolutely can if you're interested. You can do it like this. So the, just to, to get going here, the syntax of a jQuery Ajax request is dollar sign. I'll make that a little bigger. There we go. Dollar sign, Ajax, obviously. And then we pass it an object. And this object has a, some predefined keys that we need to, well, not predefined, we need to define some keys so that the Ajax request can go through. So can you think of a, a couple of things that every, so um, we're still working in the realm of HTTP. We're still going to make HTTP requests, but we're not going to do it using the traditional browser method of get and post. Um, so since we're in HTTP, what does every HTTP route have? We talked about it last week. There's two parts to every route. Sorry? What has the path, you would say? OK. So they take that as a URL. They call it the, like, which URL do you want to call? And then the method, method even. There we go. And which method that you want. So this could be get. It could be post. Um, interestingly, uh, you remember learning last week or possibly the week before that HTTP, well, HTML forms and things like that are limited to get and post. You can't actually make put, patch, or delete calls from an HTML form. Um, we are not limited to that with AJAX requests. We can absolutely make put, patch, and delete requests if we want to. If we're calling to a RESTful API that actually utilizes these other verbs. Uh, for today, we're going to stick to get and post, just for simplicity. But those other ones are there. Um, so it takes one more thing, and that is the data type. What data type are you expecting to come back from the call? Uh, this could be text HTML if you're expecting the contents of a web page. Um, but as we, I briefly alluded to, we are going to expect JSON to come back. So you put in the path whatever it would be, example.com slash users, let's say. So you'd make a get request to this URL, and you're expecting to get back this data type. Yes? Uh, more than likely, yes. It's how it parses it underneath. Um, because you never have to call uh, JSON parse or JSON stringify, it just gives you back an object. So more than likely, that's exactly what it's for. So um, this handles the uh, and XML part, if you will. But how do we handle asynchronous? Because JavaScript is not asynchronous out of the box, right? It's completely synchronous. So how does JavaScript fake asynchronous actions? How have you been doing it so far? Sorry? Callbacks. That's exactly right. Um, so the way that this takes a callback is it actually has another property on it that accepts a function, it accepts a callback function. I'm just going to use the arrow function syntax for this. Uh, so on success, jQuery will call this success function for us. And we could do something very simple like console log the data. Obviously, we're not going to console log it because that's next to useless in the real world. We're actually going to update the DOM. Um, but you can you see where we're going here. You have your data. And then you're going to do something with it. And it accepts one another uh, prop on error. And same thing, we can console.error the error. I'll scroll up a little bit there. There we go. Uh, does everybody know that 
console has other things besides log. It has info, error, a bunch of different things. It doesn't really affect, um, it still writes to the terminal. It just changes the way that it looks in the terminal. So that you can more, like an error will show up differently than a log. So you can see it, it'll be highlighted in your terminal as it scrolls out. So this is the basics of an AJAX request using jQuery. Does that make sense? We, we're, we have our method and our route. We're expecting a certain data type to come back, more than likely for the parser. And then we have a success callback function and an error callback function. And so why don't we take this and we'll try it out on a live website. So the trick to this is you have to find a website that is already, wow, that's tiny that is already running jQuery. And thanks to Nima, I know that Wikipedia has already has jQuery loaded. So you can throw in a dollar sign. And there it is. And we could do something like, uh, what do we have that's got some content in it? There we go, an ID of site notice. So we could do something like, And actually just grab that object. Apparently I missed it. Is it? Oh, it's site notice. There we go. Found site notice. There we go. And we actually we returned a jQuery object. It's got the base URI and things like that. Um, this is just to demonstrate that jQuery is in fact loaded on this site. So we're just going to play around with making an AJAX request. Um, does anyone have any, have you come up with any of your favorite lorem ipsum placeholder APIs? Again, tiny. There we go. Um, so everybody's familiar with lorem ipsum, right? It's just random Latin that looks like actual text. Um, it is gibberish in Latin as well, if you plug it into Google Translate. Um, but there's an awesome API that will return bacon-related lorem ipsum uh, when you make a request to an endpoint. So let's see what that looks like. So we have meat and filler. Uh, so we have corned beef, biltong, chicken. You can see we've got corned beef in there again, shank. So it looks like lorem ipsum, but it's got some bacon references or meat references in there. So we're going to grab this URL. And we're going to plug it into our Wikipedia thing here. Oh, that made it call it. OK. Ajax. OK, so the first thing it takes is a URL, right? And we've got that. And then we have a method. And what method are we going to use? What, what method did the browser just use? Get? Get, absolutely. So we're going to throw in a get there. And then we're expecting a data type. Presumably that is JSON. It looks like JSON. It might be text. And then let's just throw in our success. And as per usual, sure. Yeah, absolutely. How's that? There we go. OK. And we're going to console log that data. And then we're going to close out our function. I'm not used to writing it all in one line. Close out the object. Close out Ajax and cross our fingers. And look at that. We actually retrieved five elements in an array using our Ajax call. And we console log the results right there. And that looks extremely similar to what we did in the browser, right? We just made a GET request, but you notice that the Wikipedia page didn't refresh. In fact, nothing was changed at all on the page. We were able to use jQuery to do that completely behind the scenes. And we're going to do the same thing with our app. 
So there we go. There's our lorem ipsum. So now, why don't we jump into uh, making our own server? Um, so I'm in a brand new repo. All I have is this readme so far. Uh, I want to push this to GitHub later. So what do I need to do? It's a brand new, brand new repo. So I'm going to git init, right? So that I get my .git file. Uh, close this for a second. You can see that we have our .git there. And then I'm going to need to use express. So I'm also going to initialize with npm so we get our package.json file. And I'm just using dash y just so it goes with all the defaults. And then we're going to install express. Awesome. That looks great. Everything worked. Oh, and so now let's touch server.js. And we'll grab the server. There we go. Control. There we go. OK. So we're going to use the absolute bare bones of an Express app. So const app. This should look extremely familiar to everybody by now. So we're not actually going to um, create any routes or anything. We're just going to have a single page, one index.html with a JavaScript file that's going to make all of our AJAX requests for us and do all of our DOM manipulation. So all we have to do is say app.use. Uh, what is it? It is, I can never remember this, express.static. There we go. And we're going to throw in the name of a folder. So what this is saying is anything that's in the folder that we specify will be made available to clients requesting from our website. So if there's an index.html inside this, this public file, then that will be returned to the client without Express having to do anything else, without having to write app.get slash and all that other stuff. Um, this is a great way of serving static assets, like images, style sheets, things like that, that accompany your application. Like if you're using uh, EJS for server-side rendering, this is how you would get your um, CSS to the front end. Like you might server-side render an EJS template, fill it with all of the variables and everything from your template URLs, serve it, and then when it hits the browser, it gets the CSS and it styles the page and shows it to the client. So we're going to create a public folder and we're going to serve everything from there. And then we just need one more thing. We need an app.listen on port 3000. And we're just going to console log. App is listening on port 3000. There we go. So let's fire up the server and check to make sure that everything's working. And there we go. No errors, didn't crash. App is listening on port 3000. Pretty simple, right? That is as much server-side code as we're going to write today. That's it. We want to focus just on using AJAX and jQuery. So as promised, we are going to need kill the server. We're going to need that public directory. And inside of there, we're going to start with an index.html. And let's start the server back up. We have our new public folder, index.html. We use the magic of VS Code to scaffold out an HTML5. Does everybody know that you can do that? It makes it really easy because I can never remember any of this stuff. I'd have to look this up and just copy and paste it from somewhere. So we're going to throw in Ajax there. And just to make sure that everything is working so we can visually see something, we're going to say fun with Ajax. It may not seem like we're having fun yet, but we will have fun with Ajax. All right, now let's jump back to Chrome. And we'll visit localhost 3000. And we see fun with Ajax. Hooray. All right, 
A couple weeks ago, this would be the end of the lecture. <laughs> All right. So let us, I, there, if you don't feel like, um, the great thing about jQuery is it has evolved over the years. As it became more and more widely adopted, they start added, adding more and more uh, helper methods and wrapping underlying methods. So just like we don't want to use that XML HTTP request object, we want to use jQuery Ajax. J that this, uh, if we jump back to our readme, this is still is a little bit verbose. You're specifying the URL and the method and the data type. Um, so jQuery actually gives us some helper methods to go along with that. And obviously, as you learned yesterday, um, jQuery can be written as either jQuery or the, the alias of the dollar sign, right? Either one is, will work. So let's take a look at what the get does. So the get takes in a URL, it's probably pretty small, takes in a URL, some data, if you were going to pass along any data, what to do on success, and then you define the data type. So slightly shorter, right? We, we don't have to specify that, um, we don't have to specify the method. Because we're saying jQuery get, a dollar sign get. We can go even farther than that and use jQuery get JSON. And then we don't even have to specify the data type because we're telling jQuery, when I run this method, I expect to get back JSON using a get request. So all we have to do is type in the URL. We're not going to pass along any data because it's a get. Um, and then we just throw in a callback function on success. So this is the syntax that we're going to use. You can absolutely use this, what I would call the long form, every time if you want. Then you have explicit control. You can change your methods. You can change your data types. You can do whatever you want. Um, because you might also notice there's one thing that's missing from these helper methods. Error. That's exactly right. We lose the ability to handle the error in this way just by passing in a property. Uh, so if you're concerned about errors, you will have to handle them in another way if you expect them to come up. Uh, so we're going to use this syntax here. So we are going to need a client side. Let's kill the server again. We're going to need some client side somewhere to store all of our JavaScript. So I'm just going to make an app.js and put it in that public folder. And this is probably a good time to check and see um, what we're looking at. So I just ran git status. And I see that it wants to put the node modules folder into our, our uh, source control. So we don't want that, right? So how do we stop git from, from throwing the, sorry? Git ignore, that's right. Touch dot git ignore. And we're just going to open that up. We do it in Vim. Does it not see it? Oh, it's inside of, uh, hang on, we'll just do it here. Touch git ignore. There we go. And we'll just add node modules. Save that. And we'll run git status again. There we go. Happy. No node modules. Git add everything and git commit. Um, let's just call this set up server and public directory. There we go. We'll get the server running again. Since we're not making any changes at all to the server, if I wasn't stopping it to commit to git, then we wouldn't have to worry about it at all because we're just doing 100% client side. And so every time we make a call to this page, we refresh it, we actually serve those files again if there have been any changes to them. So you don't have to worry about NodeMon or anything because we're 100% on the client. And every single time you refresh, you get a new version of those pages if there have been any changes. Or if we look in the network tab and then we refresh here again, We'll see that we made a call to localhost, and it was 200. And if we make that call again, oh, it's not going to do it. We'll check it out later, but sometimes you'll get a 204 
that everything's fine, but nothing changed about the file that you asked for. So it didn't bother to change it. To send over a new one, it just said everything's fine, just use the one you've already got in memory. OK, so uh, we're going to need something else as well. We want to bring jQuery and add it to our project, because it currently doesn't exist in our index.html. How do we add jQuery to our project? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. If I want to add anything to my front end projects, I just type in the name of the package and then include the word CDN for uh, Content Delivery Network. So that one's already purple. We'll grab the minified version. I'm going to copy that to the clipboard. And where should we put it? Where should we, or does it matter where we put our includes of JavaScript? OK. That's right. That. OK, I, I like that. Um, so we're going to put this down here. And we're going to paste that in. It said it copied to clipboard. Do it the old-fashioned way. There we go. And we'll paste that in. And then we also have our new app.js file. And we'll bring that in in the same way. And we always want to put that underneath whatever libraries you're bringing in, right? Because the way that the browser works is it doesn't use the requires that we have on the server side. Where is our server? It doesn't utilize this for sharing information between documents like module.exports and requiring them in. The way that it works on the browser is everything gets loaded in in the order that you state. So if we want to utilize jQuery, then we have to put jQuery above whatever file we want. And if you bring in Bootstrap and Bootstrap's JavaScript, you would have to bring in jQuery, then Bootstrap's JavaScript, then your own JavaScript. Otherwise, you won't have access to the variables and methods that you think you do, or you think you should have. Does that make sense to everybody? That it just loads from the top to the bottom? And so now we can go into our app.js. And just to be doubly safe, how do we make sure that everything is loaded before we start trying to grab DOM elements and interact with them? Using jQuery. Sorry? Sorry, one more time. Uh, in order to grab something? Yeah, we absolutely can. But before that, before anything else, what event are we waiting for so that we know that the DOM is loaded so we can start interacting with it? Document ready. That's right. And there's a shorthand for that. If you just pass a callback function to jQuery, then it says, oh, you're waiting for document.ready. So now if we look at this, remember why uh, we said we were going to put everything at the bottom of our file, at the bottom of our body. Do you remember why we said that? We said that we were waiting for everything to load, right? But then in app.js, we're going to put all of our code inside of a document.ready function. So we're waiting for the document to load, and we're waiting for the document to load. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? That's true. That's correct. 
Exactly. Uh, so we could absolutely move these scripts up into the head so that we keep all of our imports and our style sheets and everything all together in one place. Because that's covered by this, by the document already function. But can anyone, and this is probably a bit of a stretch, but can, does anyone know why this is actually a better method for this? Putting this at the bottom and put this inside of a document already. Do both together. Well, that's, that's exactly it. We're, we need to decouple what we're doing. Let's say you're working on a team with someone, and their job is to design the index HTML and do all of the styling. And they're just going to give you a list of IDs, and you're going to write all of the jQuery that grabs it all. Well, if you know that the script is at the bottom, you could just start writing your jQuery right here, right? And just start grabbing elements and manipulating them. But that inherently makes a guess. You're making a guess that that other dev put all of the scripts at the bottom of the body. And if they didn't, then your code is going to fail because you're going to start trying to grab elements of the DOM that don't exist yet. So, and the other way is if you're working on the index page and that's your job, this means that you are saving what if the developer on the other side just started writing jQuery, DOM manipulation. So if you're working on Teams, this is definitely a thing to think about, is how you decouple the code so that you're not having to make guesses about what the other devs have done or what their code files look like. You just say, mine is fine. I'm wrapping it in a document already function. And on the other side, you're saying, my code is fine because I put all of the scripts at the bottom of the body. So either way, I've done my job. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Uh, so, why don't we put in some kind of, actually, let's just start with our, so we're going to need, to make things a little simpler, we're going to store that URL in a constant called base URL, so we don't have to type out that, the whole thing every time. But we're not actually going to use bacon ipsum, as much fun as that would be. It doesn't really give us those, the ability to uh, manipulate the DOM in a real world situation. So instead, we are going to use a uh, JSON. There we go. JSON placeholder API. I think they say it best. It's a fake online REST API for testing and prototyping. So we could have spent half an hour and generated our own API to respond to various get and post calls. But instead, we're just going to use this placeholder and make calls to this API instead. Um, does everyone remember what REST stands for? You got the, the S and the T. It's actually representational state transfer. And the reason why is because the URLs that you call, combined with the methods, represent the underlying data structure. So that's why it's representational state transfer. So when you make a get request to slash posts, what do you expect to be returned from that get request? Presumably a list of posts, right? Probably an array. So when you make a get request to slash posts slash one, what do you expect to get back? The first, or a post with an ID of one. Yes. And posts slash one slash comments? the comments for the post that has that ID of one, right? And so this is that representational portion of REST. It says, I can make a guess at the underlying data structure because I can see how your endpoints are lined up. And you know that if someone, an uh, API was cr created with a RESTful architecture, then you can just go ahead. You don't have to read through their documentation. You can guess it. Oh, I can hit slash posts and then slash one. And we can see some of the other endpoints here. They have a slash users. They don't bother to say, oh, you can call slash users slash one, because that just tracks. 
slash photos. I bet we can call it slash photos slash one. And we'll get back the photo with the ID of one, right? So this is our fake REST API. We're going to make a call to this get slash posts. And if I click on it, um, I have a, a Chrome to add-on that just renders it nicely. Uh, I think I can view source. No, it's not actually going to let me view source. Um, so this is what our data is going to look like. We're going to get back 100 posts with a user ID, the post ID, a title, and a body. And that's something we can actually render on our page. So I'm going to grab this root URL. And I'm going to throw it into our constant. And then what was that shorthand function that we were going to use? Get JSON. That's right. And it takes, let's just look at that syntax again. It takes the URL. Data, if we were going to send it, we're not going to send any data because we're just making a get. And then a callback function on success. Seems pretty simple. So I'm going to use template literals. Is that OK with everybody so that we're not concatenating on? We're going to have our base URL. And then we're going to concatenate on slash posts. So there's our URL. And then we have our callback function. And we'll do exactly what we did before. We're going to console log whatever data comes back. Does that look good? OK, let's just make sure our server's running. It is. And we'll head back to fun with Ajax, and we refresh. And we'll open up the console. And what do you mean failed? Look at that. OK. I messed up. This slash and this slash are concatenating together, and they're putting in both slashes. So we'll take that off. And we'll run this again. We'll refresh the page. And there we go. We have one, an array with 100 objects in it. And that happened as soon as the document was ready. You notice there was a brief pause. Well, it waited till everything was loaded on the HTML. And then there's, we just made our first AJAX request. This is exclusive of our browser saying, localhost 3000, serve me an index page. We then, once that was all served, we then made an HTTP request to another API that's outside of our app, grabbed data from it, and brought it in, all without the user having to do anything at all. So why don't we? This is not, um, I mean, this might be ideal, but let's make sure that we can actually see what's going on. Why don't we throw a button on here? We'll give it an ID of, let's just say, get posts. That way we have something to click on, a little more user interactivity, not so much magic going on. So how do we grab something with an ID, just as a refresher from yesterday? We know that we have an ID of get posts. How do we make reference to that How with jQuery? With the pound sign, right? Same as a CSS selector. We're going to get posts. And then uh, did you go over this? How We want to listen for that button's click event. So what method are we going to call? Uh, we could do dot on, absolutely. We could do it like that. And then pass a callback function. There's an even shorter syntax, again, because jQuery has been around for so long, dot click. And then. Amazingly, as you could probably guess, this takes a callback function. You're going to start, and it's actually past the event, um, so that you could do something like prevent the default or prevent propagation, things like that. We're not actually going to do anything with the event because we simply want the click. We're going to say on click, do this. On click, get all of this, make this AJAX request, and console log the result. OK? So inside of this callback function, when the document's ready, we're going to register a click listener that takes a callback function that makes an AJAX request to another API 
and accepts a callback function and log the data to the console. So we're getting very nested here. And let's make sure that everything is still working. So we'll refresh this. And now we have a get post button. And we click get posts. And there's an array. And if we click get posts again, we actually, it's, it's because this, uh, this side's too small. You can actually see that every single time I click get posts, it makes an AJAX request. So we're up to like 1,000 posts at this point. But this gives us something that we can, we can actually start manipulating the DOM. This gives us a great place to start. We've got all of this data. We have 100 uh, elements. We have 100 objects with a body, an ID, a title, and a user ID. And we can start doing some DOM manipulation like you uh, learned about yesterday, right? So instead of console logging, why don't we say, so we know that data is an array, right? We can see that in our console. Uh, this is actually, um, I'm not just doing this for the demonstration. If I'm interacting with a, a real API at work, and I don't know necessarily what's going to come back, maybe the documentation is terrible, maybe there is no docs, maybe it's for a previous version, I will just console log. And I'll say, what am I getting back? What does an object look like? What keys does it have on it? Um, so now we know. So we're getting back an array with 100 items. So how do we iterate over every element in the array? Let's say we want to create a DOM element for each one of these. We want a post to show up on the page every single one. For each. I like for each. It's got a nice syntax. And so why don't we, just a little better variable naming, instead of saying data, we know that we're getting back the posts. So let's just call it posts. And then we'll say for each post and, hey, another callback. This is great. OK, so we need a couple of things. We're going to need somewhere to mount all this stuff in the DOM. So I'm going to grab a section just for semantic purposes. We've got a section, and I'm giving it an ID of posts. So we have somewhere to put all of these posts actually living on our DOM. So we're going to grab that. Uh, and we're going to say, just for right now, we're going to say posts equals, uh, what did I call it? I just called it posts, right? There we go, posts. Perfect. OK, so uh, I don't know if you went over it yesterday, but the uh, standard. The, the usual way that we do this, the convention, is if you have a jQuery variable, prefix it with the dollar sign. Um, because that gives a bit of meta information about the variable. You know that it's not just a string or an integer or a Boolean value. You go, oh, that is a jQuery element and all the things that come along with a jQuery element. We have, we have the text, we have the value, we can perform different operations on it, we can see the parent and the children and all that other stuff. We have this massive object. So this is actually a form of what's called Hungarian notation. Believe it or not. Hungarian notation is an identifier naming convention, right? In which the name of a variable or function indicates its type or intended use. Uh, so that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, we are saying to other devs who read our code, that's a jQuery element. It's got a dollar sign in front of it. There are standards in, if you've ever done any coding in like um, uh, VBA, if you did like Excel, any of the office things like Word or anything, that's all written in VBA. That's how you interact with them. How's our time doing? 1047, we're still OK. Uh, so in VBA, if you create a string, you would prefix it with str. That's Hungarian notation. If you created a Boolean, you would prefix it with bool. Integers, obviously, prefixed with int. That way, you know what kind of data type that integer, that variable is expecting. We're using Hungarian notation. We don't worry about that in JavaScript because it's not strongly typed. It's very weakly typed. It will just make a guess. We didn't have to say this base URL is a string. We just threw a string into it. 
if we change this to let, we could change it to a Boolean or an integer or something like that. So we don't normally use Hungarian notation in JavaScript. But this is one place where we do so that you know that this is a jQuery element. Hopefully you found that more interesting than boring somewhere along the spectrum. All right, so we now have our posts. And why don't we say post.append, and we will create, actually, we'll do that in two separate steps. We are going to create a new post. And let's just call it an article. And I want to create an article element using jQuery. Did you do element creation yesterday? OK, so how do I create an element? I want to create an article element. That's right. If jQuery sees this, then it says, oh, you want to create something? If it sees something like this, then it says, oh, you want to grab something. Um, if you make this mistake, you'll find that your code fails. But it fails completely silently because this is still valid. It's just crawling and looking for an article that doesn't exist. And then it will append everything onto that article that doesn't exist, and then it will just go away. And your code will go, I don't, I don't see anything wrong. This is syntactically correct. Uh, so this is something that can catch you up. So just make sure that you are creating an article. And inside of that article, oh, you know what I'm not doing? There we go. Um, we are going to have a title. And we'll put this inside of a header element. And we'll just use the dot text to put something in there. So we have our post, right? So what kind of post would we want? What, kind, what property on that object, uh, let's jump back over here, do we want to put in the title? We have a body, we have an ID, we have a title and a user ID. Obviously, title, right? Keeps uh, sliding the wrong way. So how do we access that? We've got our post. How do we access a prop on that post? Post.title. There we go. And now let's make sure that we call article.append, and we'll append the title. And then post.append, and we'll append that article. So we are grabbing that section of the DOM right, with an ID of posts. We are then going to create an article. And inside of that article, it will have a header with the text of post.title. And then we're going to append that to the article, and then append that to the post. So everything's saved, server running. Let's see what happens. Refresh, hit get posts, and look at that. Nothing shows up in the console anymore, and we're actually seeing all of the titles from all the various ones. Let's, uh, let's use some string interpolation here to make this a little more evident. We'll say title, and we'll wrap this. There we go. And we'll reload. Get posts, and there's all of our titles. And we can see that if we look at the elements on our page, we now have the section ID of posts with all of these articles inside of it. We created 100 articles at the click of a button. And you can see all of these titles here. So what happens if we hit get posts again? Sorry? It will absolutely append more. Uh, so let's take a look at, can you see the size of the scroll bar there? See how it's about that long? And if we hit get posts a couple of times, now the scroll bar is that long. Because every single time we hit that, we're retrieving 100 posts from that API and bringing it back. And you can see that now our section just goes on forever. And each one of these articles has a header inside of it with that title text that we appended in there. How are we doing for time? 10.52. We've got a couple more minutes. Uh, why don't we just finish this post off, and then we can take a break. So our post has a header. Uh, why don't we grab uh, some, a body? And we'll just give this a p tag. And we'll give it the text of post.body. Uh, 
I believe that was one of the options in our JSON placeholder. Yeah, we have a body, a title, and a user ID. So let's also give it a footer. And we'll add post dot user ID. There we go. And now we want to append on. So we have our article, right? Our parent. And we want to put inside that the title, the body, and the footer, right? So we can actually do that all inside of here. And so what we've done is we've actually just appended in order title, body, footer onto that article, right? Does that make sense to everybody? We could also have done dot append, dot append, dot append every time. But there's actually this shorthand of just put all these elements in. And the order absolutely matters. Think of it like uh, pushing elements into an array. You know, push, we'll just add it as the last element. So we're appending on title, which will make it the last element. And then we're appending on body. And then we're appending on footer. So that's how we'll get it back in the DOM. If we put body in front of title, then we get body title footer. So the order that we do this absolutely matters. Let's jump back over to fun with Ajax, refresh, get posts, and now we have a title, the body, and the user ID. Let's, uh, let's make that look a little better as well. Let's call it user, and we'll throw that in. There we go, and refresh and get posts. Now we can see that we have a user. So we have title, the body, and a user. And we have that 100 times for every single time we click this button. But notice again that we didn't make any other calls. We didn't, we didn't have to refresh the browser, nothing. Every single time we hit get posts, new posts are added to the bottom of this list. Um, Let's do one more thing really quickly before we go to break. I want to style this a bit because it's not, it's not looking the greatest. We're working in Web 2.0 here. We left, we left 1995 and GeoCities and stuff behind. We want to make a, a decent looking website. So I want to add, let's bring this up and kill the server. I want to touch public, even public. There we go. Styles.css. There we go. And we'll get the server running again. And so now we have this style sheet in our public folder here. Um, and let's say articles uh, is going to have a uh, oh, margin 10 auto, padding 10 pixels. Sounds good. Um, should probably have a border of one pixel solid. Uh, what's a good border color? Black. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and sorry. Oh, okay. And uh, why don't we give it a border radius of something like eight pixels? Because we are in, you know, we're in the modern web development era. We've got some nice borders there. Inside of that, we have a title. Oh, sorry, not title. Um, what are we creating? Uh, we have our article. We have a header. Header is where we put it. Let's say change the font size to slightly bigger. Let's say 1.2 rem. And we'll give it a color. Can we get a, a, any color other than black? Something that it has a high enough contrast that we can see it on the screen here. Green. I like it. And we won't bother styling the, uh, the P, because it'll be just be in the middle. And we'll make the font size a little bit smaller. And we'll give it a color of something like uh, light coral. There we go. Perfect. This should look fantastic. As you can tell, I am a front end developer at work. Um, does anyone have any, uh, does everybody know what a rem is? That's right. It's a relative m. Uh, and what's the difference between an, what's the difference between an m and a relative m? A regu regular m versus a relative m. What's the difference? Is it like, like 
Well, if we had changed this, if this was 1.2m, then it would be 1.2 times the size of the parent font. So whatever is wrapping this. So in this case, the header is inside of the article. So if in here we changed it to uh, the font size is 24 pixels, then this would be 1.2 times 24 pixels. By changing it to rem, what we're saying is we want it relative to the, to the body. Generally, if you don't define anything, it will be 16 pixels. So if you want to make sure that no matter how you style other things, your font size always stays the same inside your header and your footer, use rem instead of m. Because you can do things like this, where you change a font size and you don't realize it, and then everything's out of whack because you're now 1.2 times this size and stuff like that. So if we use rem, we know that we're always relative to the body, the font size of the body, which is generally 16 pixels. OK, we need to do one more thing in our client side here in order to actually be able to see those styles be applied. So what do we have to do? Import the styles. That's right. Link rel equals style sheet. href equals styles. Self-closing tag. There we go. And now, server is running. Server is running. Let's jump back over here. Refresh. Hit get posts. And there we go. Oh, look at that. That's beautiful. That light coral, I really like that. All right, so we have our green. So now we can see all of our posts. They're very well delineated. We can see everything on our page. Uh, I'm just going to do one more quick thing before we go to break. 100 posts is, a is an awful lot to run through. So where we do our posts stop for each here, let's just slice. And we'll slice off the first 10. That way, when we refresh and we hit get posts, we're only getting 10 elements back. And this is a little easier to scroll through. And then every time we hit get posts, we're getting another 10 elements. Cool? All right. So in review, just before we go for break, check out our readme. Use AJAX to retrieve data from a remote server. We did that. Use jQuery to update the DOM with that retrieved data. Fantastic. Let's take a 10 minute break. We'll come back at 10 after 11.
All right, everybody ready for round two? More, more fun with Ajax. All right, part two. Uh, so what I haven't done in a while that I usually like to do is commit to my Git. So let's check out. All right, looks like we have modified app.js and index.html, and we have added a new style. So if I want to see, um, oftentimes at work, I'll be working on a problem, and I'll, I'll change a bunch of different things, and then I'll undo them, and I'll change something else. And it can be hard to remember once you finally get it working exactly what you did. So if I run git diff, we can actually see the difference between the old file and the changes that I've made. Uh, so here we're looking at app.js, and we see that I have added all of this green. So that's our new information that we added. In index.html, we added the link to the style sheet. We added our button and our section, and our script includes at the bottom. And to get out of this, you just hit Q. So I'm going to add everything, and I'm going to commit. And uh, added style sheet, updated app.js, and index.html. There we go. And now we know that we're, we're working on master, and everything's committed. And we're ready to go again. So let's get our server started back up. If we look at our readme, we have achieved these first two objectives. Uh, before we move on to submitting data, making a post request, I want to do one more thing, because if we look at this, everything looks great except for this user1. And I use great like sparingly. Uh, but it would be nice to know who user number one is, actually get a name. So I'm willing to bet that there is an API for slash users. Oh, there is. Hey, there we go. So this is just JSON placeholder uh, dot type of code dot com, the same one we've been using. And since it's RESTful, as we talked about earlier, I'm willing to bet that we can say slash user slash one and get back the ID one user. There we go. And if we had, let's say, ID seven, there we go. Now we get Curtis. So we can use this. <laughs> I know. It's <laughs> nothing at all. They're, they're all over the place. And it's not just that one, it's everyone. Clementine Bach, username Samantha, email is Nathan. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can tell this is absolutely randomly generated. Yes, yeah, we should, we should look that up. I, be, I bet it's real. It's got latitude and longitude. They got a website, Ramiro.info. I'm not sure what that has to do with Clementine, Box, Samantha, or Nathan. Um, but there you go. The street's called Douglas Extension. There you go. OK. So we have this slash users slash ID. And we can use that to make our user look a little better here. Uh, so why don't we go back into our app.js? And here's where we're doing that. I'm just going to capitalize this. There we go. So here is where we would want to grab that information from the server and plug it into this footer, right? So what method, what tool do we have at our disposal for making a request to another API um, without refreshing the browser? Get JSON. Absolutely. So inside of this get JSON, we're going to call get JSON again. And we know that that takes a URL. So we have our base underscore URL slash users. I believe it's users. Yes, users. And then we have a slash. And what would we put after the slash? The user ID. Exactly. So we can just concatenate on. If I can grab it here, right here, grab that, and put that in. So I'm going to separate this out. So it's a little easier to see. OK. So we are going to make a get JSON request to this endpoint built out from the base URL slash users 
plugging in the user ID. And then we're going to get back, let's call it the user. And we're going to use that to construct a real footer. So we have our footer in here, and our text is going to be user. We now have access to the user, which is an object with a name, a username, an email. So why don't we grab name and email and throw those in there so, so that our posts actually get signed. So we'll say user.name. And then inside of some brackets, we'll say user.email. So everything look good? Yeah. Scoping issue, absolutely. Um, VS Code is trying to hint that we have a scope error, that we have an issue. Because see how this footer is not the same brightness as this? Your, your IDE, of whichever one you use, but Visual Studio Code is fantastic for this, it's trying to help you out and saying, this is an unused variable. And so why, if I declare it's in here, and then I have this out here, scope, right? So what would happen if I said, let footer out here, and then inside of here, I said footer. That should work, right? Everybody cool? OK. Let's go back here. We'll refresh. So right now we have user1. Refresh, get posts. Not there. You can debate afterwards whether I was expecting it to be there or not. But not there. Let's go back to our code. Why? Why would it not be there? That's exactly right. Since JavaScript is synchronous, it's just going to continue running the code. So it creates the article, the title, the body. Then it makes a get JSON request. It says, cool, awesome. And then it runs down here, and it appends title, body, and footer. So it's actually appending something to the DOM, but it's an empty element. It just says, OK, that was undefined. And it just continues on. And then it appends to the DOM, and it closes. And it did absolutely make this get JSON request. It's just by the time the data came back, that ship had sailed. So if you are relying on asynchronous actions, you need to put everything inside the callback, everything that you want to happen. So if we take this, cut that, and put it into here, then we can go back to const footer, and we can get rid of this one. And now, if we refresh, and call get post there. Now we have a user with an email address that's absolutely related to the user in every way. And now we can see in light coral there, we have all of our users. So does that, does that make sense? We made another asynchronous action, so we had to put everything inside of that, right? Otherwise, nothing gets rendered to it. Now, you might have noticed that all of the users are Leanne. And this isn't actually an error. This is how JSON placeholder is structured. It, they've got 10 users and 100 posts. And posts 1 to 10 are all user 1. Posts 11 through 20 are all user 2. So let's update our slice just to get some variety in here. And let's slice from 5 to 15. So we should get 5 from user 1 and 5 from user 2, right? A nice split. And let's go back here, refresh, and get posts. We see that we have Leanne, then we get some Irvin, then Leanne, then Irvin, then Irvin, then Ir. What? Get posts. Leanne, Irvin, Leanne, Leanne, Leanne. Let's uh, let's throw something else in here because there's something happening. Uh, so after post.title, we will add post.id. And let's see what's going on here. Refresh. Get posts. 6, 11, 12. 6, 11, 7, 12. 6, 11, 7, 12 again. Oh, it keeps doing OK. 12, 8. There we go. Let's do some new ones. 6, 11, 12, 8, 13. Why is this? 
There we go. 6, 11, 7, 12, 13. Why aren't we seeing, we know that user 1 is responsible for posts 5 through 10, and user 2 is responsible for 11 through 15. We slice that. So why aren't we seeing Leanne, 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 Leanne five times, and then Irvin, Irvin, Irvin five times? Why are we seeing Leanne and Irvin, Leanne and Irvin, everything all mixed up? And why aren't we seeing post 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 in order? Why are we seeing post 6, 11, 7, 12, 8, 13, 9, 14, 10, 15? Because it's asynchronous. That's exactly right. This is, we are seeing that asynchronous, the A in Ajax, working right now. Because when we make our requests in here, this was fine. We made a single get JSON request, right? And we returned an array. At first, 100 elements, which we sliced down to 10. And so those were always in the order that we were iterating over the array. But then we made it asynchronous by inside of that calling get JSON 10 times. So we're actually making 11 AJAX requests. We're making the original one. And then inside of this for each, we're making another get JSON request. And then once that resolves, then we're appending it to the DOM. So what's happening is it's first come, first serve. If 6 comes back before 11, it gets appended to the DOM first. If 11 came back before 6, as in this user information was retrieved first, then it would be first on the DOM. And so that's why we're seeing these. And if we do it enough times, we should see it all over the place. I don't know why it's so consistent right now. Usually it, it varies. Um, but you'll notice definitely that it's not 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, all the way to 15. So this is uh, the asynchronous nature of AJAX right here. It's however long it takes for those requests to resolve. Uh, so this is something to bear in mind, that if you need these to appear in a definitive order, then just doing this, what we're doing, is not going to do it for you. Because they'll be appended in the order that they come back from the server. Because this callback gets executed whenever this resolves. Whenever this data resolves, that's when all of this will execute. Does that make sense? You tracking? OK. Perfect. Uh, so we've got that. We now have our, all of our users. So next, we're going to tackle using AJAX to submit data. Because we're not just limited to get. We can also make post requests. So the first thing we want to do is jump to jQuery. And we'll go to jQuery dot post. We could do the long form. Uh, just to reiterate, we could use this and just change this to a post if we wanted to. And do it all long form if you want. Um, but we have this helper method available to us. It's a nice shorthand. You can see that it's actually Ajax shorthand methods. So the post takes a URL, surprise, passes data, and then has a su success and a data type. So we aren't going to be concerned about the data type because we're just going to pass this all to the server. And we'll see what happens. So let's check out JSON placeholder. And we'll see. It's gigantic. OK, let's see what happens. So it is a RESTful API. And it accepts post requests to slash posts to create a new post. It also takes put, patch, and delete, as you can see. Um, but for simplicity's sake, we're just going to post to slash posts and create a new post. Okay. So let's jump back over here and into our app. And first thing we're going to need is some kind of form, right? So above the post section, let's create a form. And we'll give it an ID so that we can grab it with jQuery. We'll call this new post. That makes sense, right? Um, Forms normally have two things when you declare them, right? They usually have a, a method and an action, right? Since 
that would be for telling HTML how to process the form. Since we're not, since we're going to handle it with our jQuery, we don't need to specify those. We can just leave that blank because we're going to take over the handling of this form submission. So we're going to have a label, uh, and we're going to give it. A, we're going to say it's for title. We're going to label it as title. Then we'll have an input type equals text ID. This is so it matches up with this label. This for matches up with this ID. That way, the uh, HTML knows those two are linked. But all forms need a name so that we know how to pass this along. And so, what does our what does our thing look like? Where do we have our slash posts? We're going to pass in a title and a body and a user ID. So we're going to call this title and self-closing tag. And then we'll put in a line break. And we'll do the same thing again for body. Input type equals text. ID equals body. Name equals body. Another line break. One more field for user ID. Input type equals number for this one, because we know it's going to be an integer value, right? ID equals user dash ID. And in this case, since I don't want to have to do any kind of uh, changing of the element, I want jQuery to handle it all, we need the name of this to match what they're expecting. So it's a camel cased user ID. So we're going to camel case user ID. Then we're going to put in one more line break. And then we're going to add a button. Give it a type of submit, right? Because anytime you click on a submit button, that submits the form, correct? And we're going to call this create new post. So let's take a look at how this looks. Refresh. Hey, there we go. So underneath get posts, we have our title, body, user ID, and then the create post button, right? So if we gave this some title, uh, some body, and a user ID of seven, and then hit create new post, <coughs> did you notice that the screen flashed? And did you notice what else happened? Uh, there we go. Can everybody see that? So. By default, if you don't specify anything, HTML forms use get. And get requests are always made in the URL. So you can see that it has concatenated on as query parameters, title equals some title, body equals some body, and user ID equals seven. It's done what's called URL encoding. So it's replaced all the spaces with plus signs. Um, uh, you might also see percent 20 in there sometimes. URL encoded means it makes it into a valid URL, because a, val a valid user URL does not have spaces in it. right? Um, and the other default, so we have a method and an action on our forms. right? So we found out that the default method is get. And the default action, like what URL to call, is the same URL. So it has actually just called localhost 3000 again with these, oh, with these query string parameters which is less than ideal. And this is 100% because we didn't specify an action and a method. right? So we need to grab this form. So we have an ID of new post. Uh, so let's come down here. And we have an ID of new post. And so that's the form that we're grabbing. We want to listen to an event. What do you think? What's that event called? Submit. And on submit, we are going to pass in a callback function. And that callback function gets the event. So in order to stop HTML from trying to, because even though we've now said that we're going to handle this, if we go back here and we refresh, and we get rid of this, clean that out. So we're on localhost, we hit create new post. It's done it again anyway. So what do we have to do to tell HTML, don't worry about it, we've got it? 
stop, stop propagation um, stops an event from moving farther up the parent chain, the scope chain. Prevent default. That's exactly what we need. We need event dot prevent default. And now, if we clear this out and save, and then we hit, don't save, and then we hit create post, now we see that nothing is happening. The screen isn't refreshing. It's not making, because we prevented that default behavior from happening. We said, no, we've got it. We are going to handle this with our jQuery. Don't worry about it, HTML. So we need to make, and if we jump back just quickly to our post, we're going to make a jQuery post request, which accepts a URL, some data, and then a callback function on success. So let's jump back over here. We have post. Our URL is going to be base underscore URL slash posts, right? Because of the RESTful nature, we can make a post request and a GET request to the same endpoint, and they do two different things. Now we need to pass some data. The great thing about another great thing about jQuery is it gives us a helper method and that helper method is dot serialize and what serialize will do is it will encode all of the form elements into a nice handy package for us so let's take a look at what this looks like we're going to console log we're going to grab new post and we're going to serialize it and we're going to take a look at what this looks like in our console. Let's jump to the console, widen it out a bit, and we'll put in some title, some body, and a user ID of four. Hit create new user. And this, you might notice that this looks extremely similar to what was showing up up here, right? jQuery has done this. This is, this is jQuery grabbing the form and calling dot serialize on the contents. So it takes the title field, this title, because we gave it a name of title, and then some title, body equals some body, and user ID, see in our camel case, ID equals four. This is ideal. This is exactly what JSON placeholder is expecting. So we don't have to do any more. We don't have to build an object. We don't have to manually retrieve the information. We can just call dot serialize, and it will do all of that for us. And you're probably starting to see why jQuery became so popular. Because we don't have to do anything else. We can just call dot serialize, and it, it creates an object, and it will pass it along for us. And then there's one more thing we have. We have a callback function on success. So now let's console log what JSON placeholder sends us back after we've successfully created our new post. So let's take a look at that. Jump over here. Uh, and user number four. Hit create post. And look at that. It gave us back an object, a new post that has a body, an ID, a title, and a user ID. And it, so it has actually created a whole new post for us. And if we change this to uh, uh, slightly different, I spend almost no time thinking about what should actually go into these posts. We create new post, and it gives us back a body, an ID, a title, and a user ID. You might notice that the ID is the same. This is because JSON placeholder has 100 posts already in its database. So the next one in line would be 101, right? But it's not actually creating a new post in the database. Otherwise, they'd have millions and millions of records by now from all the devs playing with it. So it's faking it. It says, yeah, I made that, and here's the post I created. And it gives it back to us. And then we do it again, and it goes, yeah, I did that. Here's that post. But we see that we are successfully making post requests without the browser refresh without having to do anything else. We are creating a brand new post, and there it is. So we want to be able to take this new object and put it on the DOM, right? What's the point in creating a new post if we can't see our post show up? So 
let's jump back over here. And I really don't want to have to duplicate all of this code, right? All the way from post all the way down to the end here. We'd have to duplicate essentially that functionality. We could just copy this and paste it into here and take this data and create a new element and append it onto the DOM, right? Um, but we want to keep our code dry, right? Don't repeat yourself. Which, I, there's another version, there's the opposite of dry, which is wet. Which I prefer, which is write everything twice. And you'll see your line count just shoot through the roof. You're like, I, I submitted a hundred lines, there are a thousand lines of code today, no problem. Just copy, paste, copy, paste. Uh, but that's less than ideal, right? So why don't we create a function called uh, append post that accepts a post and then does with proper syntax. There we go. And then that does everything that happens inside of here. So I can actually grab that post and go all the way down to, is it here? I want to say it's right there. Yes. Beautiful. And we're going to drop that into here. Append post, calls get JSON. Perfect. OK. I know it's hard to see on this screen, but we uh, all we did was just cut all that and put it into its own function. So now, when we for each here, uh, where were we for eaching? Right here. We can actually just call append post. And now this is a little simpler, a little easier to read, uh, reason about. We make an AJAX request. We get back the posts. We're going to slice 10 posts off of there. And then we're going to call for each. And instead of using an anonymous inline function, where we just open it in arrow thing, we're actually using a named function. And so this function will be accepted as a callback. And for each, we'll call this function for every post that comes through. Every time it goes through, for each gets a new post, and it submits it. And append post is expecting a post, and it just passes that along. So if we refresh and reload the page and hit get posts, we see that nothing has changed, except for the fact that the order's changed, 9, 7, 8, 10. But other than that, everything works exactly the same, because callbacks JavaScript doesn't care if you use a named function like we did, where we define the function and then told it, um, or you just do it in line. Now, why didn't we have to invoke it? That if uh, what you're saying is that the uh, for each will take this and invoke it on its own. It will just call this function and pass it the element that was in there. Does that make sense to everybody? If we invoke this, what would happen is JavaScript would expect that append post would return a function, a function that returns a function. But that's not what we're doing. We're just saying straight up, thank you, VS Code. Uh, we're just saying straight up, just use append post. OK? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, so let's say you want to pass along some metadata. Like, let's say that we're grabbing posts, right? Um, let's say that we don't want to have to grab that every single time. Because what we're doing, every time you do this, you're telling jQuery to crawl the DOM, looking for something that matches with an ID of posts, right? So let's say we didn't want to do that. Let's say we just wanted to do that once inside of the onClick method. But now we need a way for append post to get posts. So let's say that this accepts, just so we don't have to do too much of the code, this accepts, it expects posts to come along with the post. JavaScript isn't going to call append, it's going to call append post with one argument, and exactly one argument, the element in the array. So what we would have to do is we'd have to pass along, yeah. We'd have to pass along a callback function that calls append post. So this callback function would be called with a post. Then we'd have to call append post with like that. 
if you want to pass along more information. And if we refresh and call get posts, you see it works exactly the same, except again, the order is different. Um, but that's how you would pass along extra arguments if you needed to. So uh, we might as well just leave this. Functionally, they're the same. Or should, when you look at this code later, do you want me to take it back to just the append posts? Leave it like this? Yeah. OK. So this is fantastic. So um, if you're only expecting one, then you could just, and in fact, we could define another function that did exactly this and just give that to it if we wanted to get really pedantic about it. OK, so now we have this append post function. And what did we get back from sending a new post to the API? We sent the data, and then it gave us back a post, right? So let's call this post, because we got a new post back. And we can just call append post and pass along the post. Because we already have a function. Oh, it's not going to work now because of uh, let's just do an inline. And we're going to grab posts. Uh, this is because we changed the syntax of otherwise we could just call append post and pass along the post. Uh, but because we changed the syntax to expect the posts, we have to pass that along. So now if we save and we go back over here and we refresh, notice how we haven't restarted the server. Because every time we make our get request to this endpoint, the server is just serving back our index, our app, and our style sheet. We're going to uh, awesome title and user ID of four. And we hit create post. And there we go. We got an awesome title. We got a post ID of 101. We have our even more awesome body. And Patricia, who has an email address of Julian O'Connor, Julianne O'Connor for some reason. And if we uh, um, if we do this again and we hit create post, we see another, my post, ID 101. Amazing things. And Nicholas with Sherwood. So we are making a post request to the API. It's as a return value, it's giving us back a post with a title, body, user ID, and an ID. And then we're handing that off to jQuery and saying, create an element and append it to the DOM. OK, so what happens when I hit get posts? There we go. Everything shows up underneath. We still have ours. But we should probably handle this. If the user clicks, they're getting the same posts over and over and over and over and over, right? So there's a way to handle that in jQuery, believe it or not. Um, before we start, here we go. When we grab posts, there's a helper method called empty. And so what that will do is it will just take that and delete all of the HTML that's inside of it. And so this way, if we jump back over here, so right now you see that we're running this old code. So every time I hit get posts, we're putting on 10 and 10 and 10 and 10 even more. So if we refresh the page, and then I hit get posts, scroll to the bottom, and then I hit get posts, scroll to the bottom, get posts, and we're seeing the exact same thing. So if we, we can actually see this visualized, if we jump into our section here, we see all of our articles. And then we hit Get Posts. Oh, stay open. You can do it. How do I make you smaller? Just for right now, we'll make that a little smaller. I want to try and see if it'll stay open for us. Not Create Post. Get Posts. Oh, it's not going to do it. If you can get this to stay open, you can actually see the purple flash as all of these articles are grabbed, and the section is emptied, and the whole new thing is created. And you can actually kind of see it there. You see the purple flash? You can see that we're actually adding new things to the DOM. Um, and you see that we got 768, and then this time we got 679, and then this time we got 7689, 
There we go. So everything is exactly the same, but instead of the user getting the same 10 posts over and over and over, we're emptying it, and then we're appending on the new stuff. So the sad part to this, uh, and we'll find out who user ID 9 is. We're going to create a new post. We're going to scroll down to the bottom. And then we have our sad post 101 by Glenna uh, Chaim McDermott. There we go. Uh, but what happens now when we hit get posts? It gets emptied along with everything else, and all of our posts are gone. Um, so as awesome as .empty is, be aware that it's going to empty everything that's in there. It's going to completely empty that out on you. Uh, so there we go. And now if we take a look at our readme, how are we doing for time? 11.51. Our goals for today were to use Ajax to retrieve data from a remote server. We did that. We used jQuery to update the DOM with the retrieve data. We did that multiple times. Then we used Ajax to submit data, aka make a post request to a server. And all of that without ever refreshing the browser. If we look at this, we can call get posts as many times as we want. The page, the only parts of the page that flash are the parts that were re-rendered. We can create new posts. We can create multiple new posts. And they'll show up on the bottom here. All of them along. We can hit get posts. Everything without ever leaving this page. And that is the power of Ajax. And that's why we live in the, the realm of Web 2.0, and we can make powerful browser-based applications that mimic what you would get from a native application on your desktop. You get all of this fancy integration. You could have a weather widget that updates the weather every 10 minutes. Maybe we did this instead of waiting for user interaction. It did long polling, which is how they did it originally with Outlook. Um, it would just make a request, say, every 5 seconds or 10 seconds inside of a set interval. And it would just continually say, give me back all the emails, give me back all the emails, give me back, oh, there's a new email, here's your email. And you could do the exact same thing. Maybe you have a restaurant that's accepting orders or something like that. It just continually refreshes the page without the user ever having to go, oh, I want to refresh. I want to, we'll have new items added dynamically to the DOM. And that's why we have fun with Ajax. Um, we have seven minutes left. There's a different syntax, believe it or not, um, for uh, jQuery to make these uh, get requests, to make these Ajax requests. There's another syntax as well that is gaining in popularity. And jQuery Ajax promise. There we go. So we just want to touch on this briefly. You'll have an entire lecture on what promises are, but it's simply a different syntax. So instead, we call jQuery.ajax, pass it a URL right, with a settings object. And then, so we have our Ajax request. We pass it a URL. Uh, let's see if we can get to a. Something that actually resolves. There we go. So we make an Ajax request to some URL, some endpoint. In this case, they're just calling the local using a relative URL. Then we have a dot done function that takes a callback function. It's, it's just like we were doing with the success or just passing it along. We can chain on. So you see how this actually closes this request. Then you call dot done. And you can use dot .fail. That's how, remember we were passing the error handler before? But then we lost that ability when we switched to the shorthand. Using promise syntax, where you just chain on, you can chain on a dot .fail, which will have an error object in it. And then you can use a dot .always, which will always fire, success or fail. So we have dot .done, dot .fail, and dot always. And let's see if we can refactor our code really quickly to make this change. Let's look at our original get JSON. So um, the great thing 
is that every single one of these functions actually returns promises as well. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave this here, or get JSON, and then we're going to duplicate this with promises. So we're going to call it get JSON. We're going to pass in the URL. And then instead of giving it a callback function, we're going to call dot done. And dot done will be our callback function, along with the commented out code. There we go. And let's make sure that we are tabbed in correctly. Post.slice, call append post. There. I have a feeling that we're missing a closing. There we go. OK. Perfect. So we're accepting a callback function using our dot done syntax. And that should actually be there to make it even with dot done. And then we could chain on a dot fail, which would take an error. So this is a different syntax that you'll see. So instead of just passing in a callback function, we're actually moving it out and chaining on a method called dot done. Dot done. And we shouldn't actually see any difference in how this works on the browser. There you go. It works exactly the same. We call get posts, and it works every time. So it's simply a different way of, uh, instead of passing the callback, we're using promises and saying, when that is done, when the request is done, then execute this callback. And should the request fail, then execute this callback. But we're still just passing callbacks. It's exactly the same. It's just a slightly different syntax. And you'll see that in some of the examples. But you will get a full lecture on what exactly a promise is and what it means when it comes back. Um, but for right now, just think about it as it's just a different way of putting your callbacks into there and telling jQuery what to call. Cool? Awesome. Uh, we are at 11.57. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, if you have any questions you think of later, just hit me up on Slack. Cool. Thank you.